okay. Good morning. If I can have your attention, please, I'd like to call this legislative breakfast to order. Uh, my name is Bill Davies, uh, and the moderator for this year's series of legislative breakfasts, which are again being sponsored uh, by uh, the Vermont North Country Chamber of Commerce. And in behalf of the chamber, I'd like to welcome everyone. I'm also pleased to recognize Dan Pellerin, who is the vice president of the Vermont North Country Chamber of Commerce. And if there is anyone here uh, who does not receive email notifications for these breakfasts, please make sure you check with Dan before leaving and he will add your name uh, to the uh, uh, email list. Uh, we again express our appreciation to the East Side Restaurant uh, management and staff for allowing us to have these breakfasts here. And they trust us so much that I've been unable to find somebody from uh, the East Side to confirm uh, that the price for this year's breakfast, if you participate in, uh, in the food uh, and coffee and so on, is $5. Uh, and again, I may be wrong, but uh, that's what it's been for the last 50 years, so why change it? Uh, <laughs> uh, also, I especially extend my great appreciation to Todd Prano for making these proceedings available on Zoom or whatever you call that fancy stuff that he does uh, and making it so others uh, can be involved. Again, I will uh, let you know that I am probably the least technologically oriented person in this room. I don't even have a cell phone. It's too techy for me. Uh, but uh, thank you, Todd. Uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, in addition uh, to uh, Todd from the media, uh, we have Ed Barber, representing the Newport Daily Express. And again, uh, thank you, Ed. Uh, at our breakfast uh, this year, we'll have one senator and four representatives, uh, each given the opportunity to make a 10-minute presentation of the issues they're facing this year in Montpelier. <clears throat> Following the presentations of the legislators, we'll open the floor to questions and comments directed to the featured uh, legislators. Uh, those asking questions or making comments are asked to stand up here uh, to identify yourself and tell us what town you are from. If your question or comment is directed just to one legislator, uh, please so indicate, otherwise we'll let all of the featured legislators uh, uh, respond. Uh, and I'd also like to recognize uh, Russ Ingalls, a uh, senator who is not featured today, uh, but will be at the next breakfast, uh, who is president. And I saw that Larry Labor uh, is here, again, uh, not a featured legislator this week, uh, but will be uh, shortly, and he's uh, uh, from the town of Morgan. Uh, I'm not sure with my vision and the lighting that I have caught all legislators. If there's anyone here who I have missed who's not a featured legislator, please let me know. Uh, now, uh, this morning, I'm pleased to uh, welcome Senator Robert Starr and Representatives Mike Marcotte and Woodman Page. Uh, Paul Lefebvre uh, has indicated he will not be present. And I don't know if Catherine Sims is present or not. I think she was expected, but I, I don't see her. Uh, and uh, in introducing the legislators, I'll make note of the committee or committees uh, to which I believe each has been assigned. And I would ask each legislator to correct me if the information which I have obtained from the legislatives uh, website uh, needs to be updated. First, I'd like to call upon Senator Bobby Starr, who serves as chair of the Senate Committee on Agriculture and as a member of the Senate Committee on Appropriations, 
the Senate Committee on Reapportionment, the Legislative Study Committee on Wetlands, and the Vermont Milk Commission, and is co-chair of the task force to revitalize the Vermont dairy industry. I should also indicate that uh, Bobby and I go way back because I think we were both involved in the first legislative breakfast, which uh, Bobby's memory is better than mine. Uh, he figures it's 35 or 40 years ago. Uh, Bobby? Well, thank you very much, Bill. Um, I don't know. I guess I better check the website. I didn't realize I was on all those um, <laughs> different committees. Uh, the two uh, that are most important, of course, are the legislative committees that, um, that I serve on as chair of AG and and on the Appropriations Committee. And, and all, all ag bills have to go through, of course, the committee that I chair. And any money bills of any type, uh, if it's a $10 bill, uh, has to go through the Appropriations Committee. So uh, that's a very, uh, pretty, very important committee to, uh, to serve on. And uh, it's just uh, seems great to be back uh, this morning. It's been over two years since we've been able to have these breakfasts. And, um, <clears throat> you know, it, it's, it's great to see you people, but it's also good for you to see us and to hear uh, what we're doing uh, in Montpelier and make it make you feel easier if you do have an issue or question to call us. Um, you know, that it's our job to look after your needs and wants and, and, uh, and so it's important for you folks to know us so you feel easy uh, about calling us. Um, I wanted to thank Dan and, and Bill and, and the crew at Northeast Kingdom uh, TV for hosting these breakfasts. It's, um, you know, it's somebody has to be in charge of this. And, and if it wasn't for the chamber uh, hosting the thing and the east side uh, basically sponsoring it, uh, it would be, you know, somebody else's problem. And, and uh, it's really great that this all takes place because of the chamber. And, and Bill's been serving as our moderator for as many years as I've represented uh, you folks. So it, it's good that you're still with us too, Bill. <laughs> uh, um, it, uh, it's gone very well over, over the years. Um, since our uh, last breakfast that we had, um, it was on Zoom. Of course, the Senate uh, was not uh, in Montpelier at that point in time, and we could uh, we zoomed in every day. And I'll tell you, uh, it's much easier to represent you folks being in Montpelier than it is being on Zoom. Uh, it uh, you know the one part about Zoom that's good is if we're having hearings uh, that you want to participate in, uh, you know, you can get an invitation, get the numbers, uh, zoom in and save you traveling an hour and a half or two to Montpelier. Uh, doing your 15 minute presentation uh, and then driving the same amount of time to get back home and of course the parking down there is terrible. So just finding a parking spot in Montpelier for you is probably takes longer than what your, your speech would be or your conversation would be in, at the meeting. So that part is good and that's gonna continue on into the, uh, into the future. Um, so it should make it easier for citizens that want to participate from long distances uh, can take part and, and listen to the others and, and it should work fine. 
Uh, but the, the part that, that you don't see that, that we miss, or I feel I missed a great deal of, is the politicking that goes on when we're not on the camera. And sometimes that's more important than, than what you see. Uh, you know, you run into people in the hallways, uh, in the committee rooms when you're not on Zoom, and, and you can kind of talk freely where on Zoom you have to, you know, be polite and courteous and use words that everybody can accept. Uh, but um, when you're not on Zoom, well, you can tell it about the way it is. And uh, that, that's the part that makes it uh, uh, hard when we're on Zoom uh, doing all of our, our uh, deliberations. The uh, reapportionment uh, has happened since we last met. Uh, uh, I've got a few little maps that I brought with me, and some of you got them, and some tables don't have them, but uh, we, we've got enough so that each table could uh, have a, a set, and you could look that over to show you the new district lines. And the way that process works, uh, in the House, the uh, Government Operations Committee sets up their, that committee does the House portion of reapportionment. And the Senate is a committee made up of, of uh, what, there was six of us, I guess, on the Senate uh, side, uh, appointed by the President pro tem of the Senate. and. It doesn't matter if it's the House or the Senate, it's all set up uh, on a uh, per, per voter, per person residence in each town. And what has transpired in the last 10 years since we reapportioned, uh, Lamoille County, well, Franklin County, Lamoille County, uh, Chittenden County, and some of Addison County uh, grew in population. Then the rest of us either stayed about the same or lost a little population. So the way it shook out was that Lamoille County had a, has one senator um, because they've got enough population within their county even not counting Stowe, to, to have a full Senate seat. Um, Orleans County would have come out pretty close to having one senator, but we've always had two. And so the way that worked out was that um, Orleans County and Essex County, which we've always been part of, it split apart, and so now part of Orleans County, Essex County, and a little bit of Caledonia County is one district, and the eastern side of our county down through the rest of Orleans County uh, is one seat. So we, we didn't lose a senator, but Caledonia County did lose one. Uh, they they only have one now instead of uh, one member uh, and one senator because of the way the population shifted. Um, we had a 30, well, I guess it was 30, a unanimous vote in the Senate on the Senate reapportionment bill. And the unwritten rule is that we don't fool with the House map, and the House members don't fool with our map. And, and the reason we set that rule up is because there's a lot more of them than us, so we'd get beat up. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but it's sort of uh, an unwritten rule that the House does their map, 
we do on the Senate side do our map. Um, the, uh, another issue was the teacher's retirement issue. And uh, that, am I all out of time? <laughs> I haven't even gotten started. <laughs> Can I finish this one? The teacher's retirement issue um, it, uh, and the state employee's retirement issue. The last four or five years, we've known that it was a serious issue. And what, um, what transpired was 10 and 15 years ago, we were told from the treasurer and the governors and the powers to be, you know, they're a lot brighter than we are, that we had all kinds of money that the accounts were taking care of themselves and the retirement system was in good shape. Well, the last four or five years, we've known that we're in serious trouble. And with this federal money that we got, it was, you know, billions of dollars. Uh, we said if we're ever going to fix that and get us, us the people, out of hawk eventually, it's, we'd better do it now while all this money was around. So we took a, and this is crazy, the $150 million last year and another $50 million this year so $200 million and in, in dumped it into that retirement fund. And that, I mean, that's a lot of money. But if we hadn't have done this at this time, what would have ended up happening down the another 20 years, maybe 15, we would owe $2 billion and it would have bankrupt the whole state and and so our hopefully our children and grandchildren in the future generations won't uh, won't have that problem that we were facing so anyways thank you very much thank you senator starr now I'd like to call upon Representative Mike Marcotte, who serves as chair of the House Committee on Commerce and Economic Development. And just so everyone knows, uh, the, this breakfast was scheduled to run from 8 until 9, but then because of uh, the possibility we could get another half hour, it's been extended to 9.30, but uh, Representative Marcotte has already indicated he needs to do that thing called work. Uh, and he needs to leave for work at 9.15. So, uh, Mike. Thank you, Bill. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, it's really good to see everybody this morning. Um, it's been a long time. Um, thank you to the chamber, Bill, thank you, and thank you to the media that's here today. Um, but mostly thank you to the, to, to the citizens of Orleans County for coming out and hearing uh, what's happening in Montpelier. So as Bobby was talking about reapportionment on the, on the House side, um, my district got changed a little bit. Uh, so Newport City has enough, uh, enough uh, people uh, in the last census to have its own seat. Uh, so Newport City will be on its own. Um, I worked with um, Mark Higley uh, to figure out how we could make sure that Troy is made whole again. Um, if you remember 10 years ago, um, a portion of Troy was carved out in order to, um, to make sure that the two-seat district, which uh, Woody and I occupy now, um, would have, the, have a good deviation there. Uh, so um, we did figure out, uh, Mark did figure out a, a way of doing that. Uh, so my new district uh, will be Coventry, Irisburg, uh, Newport Town, Troy, Jay, Westfield, Lowell, and Eden. Um, so I've taken on a much larger area, but um, uh, I'm looking forward to um, representing um, those other towns that, that, I'll, um, that I've just picked up. 
I want to talk a little bit about economic development, workforce development um, that my committee has worked on um, since the beginning of the uh, since the beginning of the session in the second year of the biennium. We uh, we know that there's a, a huge workforce issue um, ha going on in in Vermont and in the United States. Um, I think it's called the Great Resignation. Um, we're seeing a lot of people um, through COVID have decided to um, retire. Um, others um, are deciding maybe to go back to school. Others are deciding not to participate in the workforce any longer for various reasons. Um, some of those are, are related to COVID. And um, we're also seeing uh, people becoming entrepreneurs and, and starting their own businesses. One area that we really focused on um, during the last 10 weeks of developing our, our um, workforce bill, which is H703, um, w was in the healthcare field. Um, we noted that we have an acute nursing shortage throughout the, throughout the state. Um, there was uh, one report that came back to us um, and through the healthcare committee, which Woody is a, a member of, um, that showed that uh, Vermont was, uh, had uh, over 50% uh, decline in, in nurses and the, the number two in the United States was just over 20%. So what's causing that? What's the issue in Vermont? Why are we losing nurses so rapidly? Um, so you know, when we look at the, um, the education for nurses, um, we're understanding that, that nurse educators, um, we have very few of them. And a lot of the reason is uh, a nurse that has the credentials to be able to teach um, can earn a, a much larger salary by working for one of the hospitals than they can um, working at and teaching nurses, uh, nursing students uh, at one of, the, one of the colleges. So we've um, put some money in that would raise those rates up and also um, working uh, with, uh, with the colleges on figuring out how we could uh, work that all out. Um, there's also what's called nursing preceptors. So those are nurses that are in the clinical field and in the hospitals that um, actually receive or would work with the nursing students during their um, time that they have to have uh, clinical education. And so we've added money in there to raise their rates um, so that more nurses would want to become a preceptor. There's also various other dollars uh, um, that we put in for uh, loan forgiveness, um, tuition reimbursement, scholarships um, in the nursing field. So all in all, our, our, our workforce bill was um, about $27 million, and of that, a majority of that went to uh, the healthcare field. I just want to say that, um, you know, my committee worked extremely closely with the healthcare committee, um, also with human services. We also worked with the education committee. Um, ways and means, appropriations, corrections and institutions, because they're all pieces um, within that bill that, that um, also um, delve into their areas of expertise that we don't have. Uh, so it was, this bill was a, an extremely collaborative effort uh, in the House with, with other House committees, which generally we don't see very often. And so I'm, I'm really happy um, with that collaboration. I'm, I'm really proud of that bill. Um, my committee and the other committees worked extremely hard on it. And, um, you know, my committee this year, um, we had a, a few little hiccups. Um, I lost two members from, through resignation. Um, they resigned their seats uh, because of uh, issues that, uh, work issues that they had to take care of. I was very fortunate that the two members, two new members that joined uh, my, my committee, <clears throat> excuse me, um, were able to jump right in and, and be very productive. So my committee was really working extremely well. I also lost my committee assistant halfway through. Um, I, I have a new committee assistant now that has really been able to just, it's all been seamless. So luckily for, for me and, and my committee, things worked out very well. Two other pieces that were in H703 um, deal with the career technical education and the career centers. I think I alluded to this um, the last time we were together on Zoom. Um, so in the bill, there's a $15 million re revolving loan fund 
that the career centers with building trades can access to purchase uh, blighted properties and help uh, and also purchase uh, other land or, or other properties to, um, to help fulfill their mission of teaching students in the building trades. There's also $100,000 that the Department of Labor will be using from their training programs to, um, to help students, uh, secondary students, so high school students in the 12th grade, um, go to a CTE for adult courses in the evening um, to help them um, get a little bit further upskilled so that when they graduate, if they're not going on to college, they have something that, that can help them uh, get into a good job. Another added benefit to that is that the Department of Labor will be working with those students as well and can identify those students that are having um, that aren't going on and haven't been able to line up a job yet, the, the Department of Labor can work with them uh, to help them get that job. So with that, I'm, I'm going to conclude um, and let Woody and Catherine uh, fill you in and then hopefully we have some questions from you all too. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Now I'd like to call upon Representative Woodman Page, who serves as a member of the House Committee on Health Care. Woody? Well, um, I'll just repeat what everyone else has said. Thank you all for coming here. Um, and it's, it's nice to be here in person, although I might say it is rather convenient to um, you know, have your have a quick breakfast and then jump on the computer and have a meeting, you know, but uh, it is much better to be here in person to speak with each of you individually. So this is the third year of our COVID pandemic and hopefully our state and nation are seeing the end of the crisis. Our state and Northeast Kingdom have certainly had its challenges over the last couple of years and we've all been significantly affected by it, whether it be through um, economics or whether it's through our, our, our uh, health care um, um, or well-being. And that, that applies to our, our mental health as well as our physical health. Fortunately for Vermont, as Bobby said, we seem to have been uh, blessed in getting a great deal of federal funding uh, which has helped us get through this crisis. As uh, Mike has spoken, um, his work in his Commerce Committee worked very well with our Health Care Committee. And um, some of his work, as he said, includes um, the health care. And um, the, as Mike said, Legislative committees don't always get along, and they don't always collaborate or work together. But in this case, uh, Mike and his committee are, are to be commended for reaching out to our health care committee, meeting with us, and discussing these issues, and not just the health care committee, but others, other committees as well. So um, I will just talk about some of the highlights of H703, which, which Mike has, has mentioned briefly. We did um, give $3 million to the Department of Mental Health to be distributed over three years to increase compensation for nursing school faculty and staff. And again, as Mike said, um, we not only have a crisis with, with, getting, um, uh, with having nurses, but we also have a, a crisis in our colleges and universities and not having enough um, educators to, to train uh, the nurses to go into the healthcare field. We also had $2.4 million for grants to hospital employed nurses to be preceptors for nursing school students. And a preceptor in my mind is, is a mentor or a, uh, or a sponsor to assist oncoming or incoming nurses that are new to the field um, get on board and, and learn the trade from a, a nurse that has been there for some time. So this, this monies will help uh, in, the, in the hospitals with the nurses that have so many duties. It's an extra incentive to create these sponsors 
or mentors to assist new nursing students. We had $3 million to the Vermont Student Assistance Corporation to provide grants to healthcare employees or employers to establish or expand partnerships with Vermont nursing schools to create a nursing pipeline or apprenticeship program. In many cases in your hospitals, you have um, individuals that want to continue their education and, and, um, and maybe get into another field. And this is an opportunity for, for example, for say a licensed practical nurse that wants to become a registered nurse. This allows them to continue their education and become a registered nurse. There's also monies for scholarships as forgivable loan programs. And this is for nurses uh, receiving these benefits as long as they agree to work within Vermont for each year of the loan forgiveness. Program is for students pursuing graduate work. It's also not just only for nurses, but it's also for, for physician assistants. And here again, we have a crisis. We don't have enough physician assistants. And this allows um, a loan to be repaid. A number of these nurses and physician assistants come out of school with a great deal of debt and this helps repay those, those loans off as long as they um, are willing to stay in the area and, and work in Vermont. Um, and they w should have graduated within the past five years to be qualified for this program. The state also has under the Office of the Secretary of State, um, an office called the Office of Professional Regulation, and it's responsible for licensing professionals within the healthcare arena and other areas. Our, um, our healthcare committee has tasked this organization to look at barriers to licensures for mental health and substance use disorder treatment. Um, we're trying to streamline the process for bringing in these individuals into the state of Vermont to work and to, uh, and, and to help us with our issues that we have here. I should also mention um, it's, it's, it's particularly important that we do um, get these mental health and substance use disorder specialists into our hospitals and into Vermont. We have a crisis now with um, waiting times in our emergency rooms, and Brian and Wendy probably could talk about this as well. Um, we have adolescents and adults that are suffering mental health issues, and they're sitting in our, our emergency rooms waiting for, say, a bed to open up at Brattleboro. Um, we're not talking about a few hours, but literally we're talking about days in which um, these individuals have to sit and wait until um, they can get the care that they need. So that's very important that we streamline this process and get these professionals here working in Vermont. Uh, am, am I out of time? Well, I, I, I have to say, I guess I'm becoming more like Bobby Starr, you know, uh, so, which isn't probably a bad thing. So thank you very much. Now I'd like to call upon Representative Catherine Sims, who serves as a member of the House Committee on Energy and Technology. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's really great to be here with you. Thank you to the Chamber for hosting us and Todd for all the IT support and really for all of you for being here. We're looking, looking forward to the questions and conversations after our presentations. Um, so I'm Representative Catherine Sims. I live in Craftsbury and I am uh, in the end of my first term as a legislator. And boy, um, what an incredible time this has been to join the legislature um, in the middle of a global pandemic. I think I've had the chance already to do every type of legislating there is, remote from my basement, home office, hybrid, where we're in the state house but on our computers, and then now finally back fully in person. Um, and while, as Bobby said, it's been really terrific to have um, the technology options that have emerged as a result of the pandemic so everyone can live stream and um, you know, watch recordings of our hearings, it has been really wonderful to be in the building together with colleagues doing this really important work. 
Um, and even though we're like 15, 16 months into it, uh, we just had our official seating ceremony the other week um, where new members get called and, es and escorted to our seats. And it was um, really wonderful to have my two and four year old sons uh, and my husband in the balcony watching and getting a tour of the state house. It's been a real honor to serve and, it was, and I know I can't do it without the support of my family. So it was great to have that opportunity. Um, as was mentioned, I serve on energy and technology, um, and we have been really focused on using um, this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity when we have a tremendous federal stimulus to make one-time investments that transform the future of Vermont. So we've stayed focused on the issues of tech connectivity, um, investing $95 million in broadband um, in addition to the $150 million that we invested last year. And we expect that those will be sufficient resources that we can deploy through our communication union districts to build fiber <clears throat> networks to reach all unserved and underserved Vermonters. We know how important access to the internet is for work, education, health, um, so really all aspects of our lives, and the pandemic has really highlighted that. And so. Um, really pleased to be able to continue to make that a critical investment so that we can serve everyone with internet. We've also um, made a $21 million investment in um, cell service, working with the Department of Public Service to do um, more collection of data about where we have good coverage and all the places that we all know we don't up here, and to work on um, building a number of new cell towers after a robust community engagement process where the community is helping weigh in. Where do we want to have towers so that we can expand coverage so that, um, you know, if you get stuck in a snowbank, you can pick up the phone and call someone to help you. Um, or if you, you know, don't have um, connectivity and internet at home, you can use your cell phone. So this uh, 21 million will be deployed over the next several years to do data collection, um, a community engagement process, and then um, building a couple of new towers so that we can um, bring more service to more corners of Vermont. Another bill that our committee has worked a lot on that I'd like to highlight is um, H518, and that's a municipal fuel switching bill. So our municipalities own over 2,000 old buildings that are um, expensive to maintain and to heat. And this bill looks at bringing um, more of our um, ARPA, American Rescue Plan Act, federal resources um, to our communities, $40 million to um, assess our buildings, make recommendations for energy efficiency, and to reduce um, fossil fuel usage, and then grants to um, make those investments. So whether that's installing heat pumps or weatherizing buildings or switching to advanced wood heat like pellet stoves, these resources will help our municipalities um, improve the efficiency of our buildings and ultimately save taxpayer dollars. So really excited to see that bill moving forward. Um, outside of committee, one area where I put a lot of time and energy that I'd like to highlight is um, the forest economy. I worked with um, uh, 30 legislators from all parties to do a forest economy um, listening tour this summer and fall. So we visited 16 businesses all across the state in every corner asking what's working, what are the gaps, and how can we ensure that we have a robust forest economy um, for our future? And heard a lot about the challenges that our forest and working landscape faced. And that led to a number of recommendations, one of them uh, was to establish a forest future strategic roadmap, modeled after our successful farm to plate initiative, which looked at agriculture. This is now looking at the other side of our working lands, the forest economy. The um, process will bring together all the key stakeholders um, and build a strategic plan, a roadmap. What are the critical investments that we can make and what are the policy changes that we need to make to ensure that we have a vital forest economy because it supports our forests and the myriad benefits that they provide to our economy, to our health, to our environment. And so that bill um, advanced out of House Agriculture and Forestry and then was rolled into the um, omnibus workforce bill that uh, Representative Marcotte mentioned, 703, and excited to see that work moving forward um, as well. Uh, others have mentioned reapportionment. I'll just mention, um, just add a little color about uh, my own district, which is the uh, which is a two-member district that I share with um, Representative Strong. It's the largest um, two-member district, has the most number of towns in it right now, seven, Albany, Barton, Craftsbury, Greensboro, Glover, Sheffield, and Wheelock. And the um, House uh, reapportionment process recommends splitting that into a number of single-member districts. So Albany, Craftsbury, Greensboro, and Glover will be one single-seat district, Barton, Brownington and Westmore will be a new single member district. And then Sheffield and um, Wheelock will join um, 
a district in Caledonia with Linden, uh, Newark, and a few other towns. So, um, you know, some, some big changes in our community, but I think uh, the new map does a better job at sort of reflecting the local geographies on the ground um, and uh, creating districts that are aligned with school districts and county lines and other things like that. Um, I'll, I'll end there, but it's been um, a really, uh, it, it's been the privilege of my life to, to have this opportunity to serve all of you in the house and looking forward to um, racing to our adjournment date at the end of May. It's hard to believe we are already um, at, at that time, but it's been, um, this has been quite a time as we've wrestled with a global pandemic, but I think we've done really good work in the midst of this crisis to utilize these once in a lifetime federal resources to make transformational investments in the future of Vermont and look forward to answering any questions. That brings us to the point in the program where we open the floor to you as citizens of Orleans County uh, to uh, ask questions and make comments directed to our featured legislators. Uh, those asking questions or making comments are asked to identify yourself with your name and the town uh, from which you're from and to indicate to whom the question or comment is directed. If it's directed just to one legislator, then we'll just have that one legislator respond. If it's directed to all of them, then all of them uh, will be given the opportunity to respond. Obviously, uh, having uh, all of the featured legislators have the opportunity to respond to a question or comment takes up some time. So uh, again, if your comment is directed to one legislator, please let us know. Uh, and please keep your comments or questions as brief as possible uh, so that we can afford the opportunity uh, to more citizens uh, to make comments and ask questions. So who would like to start off? Yes, Mr. Wilson. My name is John Wilson. I'm a resident of Newport, Vermont. And this is a comment, but I can change it to a question real fast if you force me to. <clears throat> One week ago in the Caledonian, VA recommends closing Littleton Newport Veterans Clinics. Last Friday, I spent an hour on the phone with Senator Leahy, Senator Sanders, Representative Welch. I've talked to the service clubs around here, and the they, VA thinks this is going to streamline care. Six years ago, I helped walk around with uh, Senator Sanders and this clinic up here to take care of veterans was the greatest thing since apple pie. And now it's on the chopping block to be closed. I've, I've talked to service clubs. Uh, our mayor in Newport's gonna write a letter to uh, VA. I have copies for all our legislators here. And if you're from a local town board, it would be nice. Uh, they wanna close this and move it to a new Seabock in St. Johnsbury. Let's build a new one and close down the one in Littleton and the one here to force our veterans, some who can't drive anyways, to have to go over Sheffield Heights. And we all know what that's like in the winter. This facility in 2019 had 832 veterans that used the Seabock up here in Newport. Is this how we take care of veterans? I don't think so. Luckily, I'm still healthy enough I can drive to White River. But I, I have a copy for all the legislatures, and in it, it just has the point of contact at the VA in White River Junction. And I, I would almost beseech, if we want to take care of veterans like we all say we're going to, uh, please, I implore you to at least let them know that this is wrong and uh, we have about a year to play the game, but if we don't do anything at all, it'll close. Thank you. Senator Starr, any comment? Uh, just, that, uh, just that, thank you, John, for bringing that up. I think, uh, you know, we've, we've done letters before as a group, and I think we could do one good letter and all of us sign it and 
for those 832 people, uh, you know, it certainly would make their life and future lives of veterans uh, much better. Uh, plus, we're losing that business from, from the area. Uh, and we've already lost enough business. Uh, we don't need to. And then <clears throat> they'll go and squander a few million dollars building a new place and the service won't be as good as what we have right now. So I think the legislators would all agree that we do one letter, I'll sign it, and I don't know about sending it to White River. I think we ought to get up higher on the ladder than White River uh, to deposit that, but thank you. Representative Marcotte, any comment? But John, thanks uh, for bringing it up. Um, I know how important that is. Um, back in 2019, my father passed away. He was a, um, a veteran. Um, he utilized that clinic um, quite a bit in, in the year before he passed away. And I know how important it is um, to our veterans here in Newport and, and Orleans County and Essex County as well. Um, I agree with Bobby. I think we could put a letter together very easily um, and send it to the right people. So um, I'm all in favor and we'll get working on that right away. Representative Page. Sergeant Major John, thank you very much for bringing that issue to our attention. I heard about it sometime last week as well. I, by the way, I am a veteran. I'm a retired military officer and uh, I think we should do all we can to assist our veterans here in the area. The VA is an excellent program, or has an excellent program in White River. I, I don't personally use it, but I know a great many people that do use those services, not just in White River, but here in Newport. And I think we should do everything we can to preserve that, uh, that, that program here in our area. And I will support it. Representative Sims. Yeah, thank you. I, I'll just, you know, echo what others have said. We, you know, would be delighted to work together on signing a letter, you know, and I, I, I see this as really symptomatic of a, a larger issue where our region often gets underserved and left behind, um, you know, and, and excited that we can all work together to have a common voice to make sure that we're not consolidating services and adding to the burden of living in rural communities where we're always asked to drive, um, you know, drive further, um, wait longer um, for the support that we need. And so, Thanks for calling our attention to this. Certainly something important to flag, um, and, and we can work together to be an advocate to ensure that everyone has equal access to important resources like healthcare. Next question or comment? Yes. Hi, I'm Peggy Stevens. I'm from Charleston. Um, and I forgot about the camera and all that. <clears throat> So uh, anyway, I'm here to talk about our, our local environment and uh, my questions are specific to the permit process uh, for the experimental pilot leachate pretreatment facility that's um, being, uh, actually the permit went out, the draft went out last fall. Public hearings were held in Newport and um, a couple of you representatives attended and expressed concerns along with many citizens locally here across party lines about uh, the fact that people didn't want to see um, any further development on the landfill and specifically didn't want to see uh, the leachate pretreatment facility cited at Coventry uh, for the additional environmental burden that it would bring to our Memphremagog watershed, and we can't forget that it's not just Vermonters who are affected locally, our Northeast Kingdom region is specifically the Memphremagog region, but it's also the 175,000 plus Canadians who drink from the lake, and I think we should feel a, a moral obligation to be concerned for them as well. Um, so I have two questions. Uh, in that process, 
What we found out after the fact was that um, actually discussions had been underway for a long time and, and decision had basically been made to site that leachate pretreatment facility at Coventry, even though people in the hearing were expressing concerns and saying they didn't want to see that happen. It was never uh, revealed in the moment that, that actually that was what was going to be coming down. And so um, even though we addressed concerns to the secretary of the ANR about the fact of this lack of transparency, um, we were told that there will be another opportunity for a public hearing. Um, no other excuse was offered or explanation for why that information was withheld from the public when people were actually talking about it in the moment. So here's my question. Um, will you agree to, uh, well, I don't know what can be done to require full disclosure of factual information in a public hearing besides saying, you know, will you please tell us everything that you know about this issue? Um, but if there is a way um, to require that full disclosure and full transparency, and also, will you be willing to stand as several of you already have, and I really want to express my appreciation for that. Uh, many of you in the legislature have actually offered bills, the Lake and Crisis Bill, the uh, H710, which is an effort to limit development on the Coventry landfill. Um, will you stand up at the next public hearing on the leachate pretreatment facility uh, that's scheduled to be cited in Coventry? Will you stand with your community who uh, doesn't want to see that further development happen? Thank you. Senator Starr. Yeah, thank you, uh, Peggy, for your uh, questions and concerns. Um, certainly, we don't expect any state officials, even ourselves, to not fully disclose um, information at public meetings. Um, and I don't know, you know, if, if that's accurate, if they did not disclose or not, but, um, you know, I would think that, you know, that's a very major problem if that is accurate and somebody should be held, held accountable. Um, as far as the bill 718, I think, or uh, 710, um, you know, if that bill <clears throat> makes it through the House, it would come to the Senate um, and uh, I don't know if it's had any action on the House side or not. But, um, you know, I've attended some of your uh, meetings in regards to uh, the lake. Um, you know, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that water runs downhill. And any time you build something uh, above and higher, it's going to run downhill. Uh, and, uh, you know, supposedly, we have the best in uh, technology being utilized at the dump. And <clears throat> the big thing, you know, it's not only the people in, in Canada that should be concerned, our own people uh, should be equally concerned, and I think they are. Uh, but what bothers me about the whole issue is people in Montpelier talk about using all this fossil fuel, right? That's all you hear, and gonna tax you for this, and if you do this, because you're using more than you should. But yet, the powers to be cite a dump on one end of the state and truck that material the entire length and then have to turn around and drive back empty. And if it was more centrally located, uh, it could be utilized uh, easier. Uh, we wouldn't 
get the uh, high roads are built for a few people because there's only a few of us here in those heavy trucks uh, running on those roads, um, you know, raise heck with them. Um, so, you know, the, if we're going to have a, a big one dump place, it should be more centrally located for easier utilization, but I, I think we're stuck with it for probably another 20 years or more because that's what the thing's designed to do, but we shouldn't just lay down and, and let them run over us. Representative Marcotte. Thank you for the question. Um, so I, I think we all need to remember that, number one, this is not a state operation. It's, it's regulated by the state, but it is a private entity, a private company. Um, so where a landfill gets sited in the state right now is up to private enterprise. Um, I know a number of years ago I sponsored a bill to um, take a look at, at, you know, what it takes to um, to site another landfill in the state. Um, there were a number of, of places that, that were being looked at, but when, when it comes right down to it, the economics just don't work. And so the question for all of us is, um, should it be a state function? Should the state take it over um, or, or site another landfill somewhere else in the state um, down the road? I, I don't know. As far as the, the the pretreatment of the of the uh, leachate um, right now. I don't know. After speaking with um, the secretary, after um, you had raised the the issues that this is this is not uh, a done deal, and that um, there is more technology that's coming out, and I think um, we need to actually hear more about it and and what the um, process will be and um, what the thoughts are from everyone. So at this time, I'm not committing to anything. I want to keep an open mind to, ever, to um, what is being discussed, and then at, at that point, uh, make a decision of whether to support it or not support it. Representative Page. Well, every morning when I go down to Montpelier to work, I go over the hill by Sacred Heart and I can see in the distance what my legislative colleagues and I call Mount Casella and it continues to grow. I've submitted bills, um, as you mentioned, um, regarding the lake in crisis and, um, and also I signed on to a bill that Catherine uh, submitted it was a short form bill regarding the leachate processing plant. I don't think it's going to go anywhere, but it's probably something that it will be something that we'll look at next term if we're all lucky enough to to go back. Um, we all know that um, Casella um, is an economic uh, program here for the state, our state and our community. We don't have many jobs here, unfortunately, and um, it does pay good salaries there, and it does employ a number of people, so we have to keep that in mind as we look ahead of what we're going to do with that landfill. I do believe it should have probably more regulation, and as I said, and as Bobby, as Bobby said, uh, you see the trucks in the morning. There's three or four trucks that I see coming up to the landfill, you know. Or I'm following a truck down to Montpelier, or, or two trucks down to Montpelier after they've unloaded their, their, um, their garbage. So it is something that we're going to have to look at. So. Representative Sims. Thanks, Peggy. Really appreciate this question. Um, you know, and, and certainly the health of our environment uh, and, and our neighbors, you know, depends on the quality of this water in, in our lake. And um, 
as folks have mentioned, you know, there, there's a multi-year lease with the Casella, so you know, uh, the dump is here for a while, um, and, and we have a responsibility to monitor that, to ensure that um, it's not negatively impacting our water quality, that we're managing PFAS um, and you know, other um, waste that comes out of, out of the dump. And so I think in the short term, you know, we need to continue to have those conversations with ANR and DEC um, about uh, how we're ensuring there's appropriate protection um, uh, while the landfill is in use, um, that we're addressing the issue of trucking and the wear and tear on our roads. Um, you know, boy, um, my poor car <laughs> with all the driving back and forth. Um, and, and uh, you know, the, the, the impact of the trucks on, on the roads. Um, and, you know, I, I think we can all probably imagine as much as we wish we won't be producing waste 20 years from now, we are likely still going to. And so we have a long-term solid waste management um, challenge before us. And I think we need to be having those conversations now about uh, how, what is the long-term plan for that site or other sites and working now to put in place um, a, a strategic plan to, to address our, our solid waste, um, both you know, where it comes from in-state and, and out-of-state and how we're properly uh, managing it. So um, you know, I, I think as, as Woody said, uh, 710 probably isn't going anywhere this year, but I think we've started, um, you know, we're building on a really important conversation that we need to continue to have with ANR and DEC about, um, and, and all of our communities about how we're managing um, our waste uh, and ensuring that we're protecting um, our natural resources um, that we all depend on every day. Next question or comment. Thank you, Frank Davis, Derby. Um, I have a multi-part question. Uh, let's see, 16 parts, no, uh, <laughs> only, only a few. Um, and this has to do uh, more nuts and bolts. It has to do with the the budget that the legislature has come up with, the state budget upcoming. And uh, I see Bobby's getting ready to take notes. Um, first of all, I would like to know where you each stand on the, on the budget that the legislature is submitting to the governor. Um, and as part of that, the, uh, Governor Scott has stated, and I correct me if I don't have this accurate, that he won't approve it unless there is, as he said, an additional $20 million for uh, affordable housing, and uh, I believe $8 million, I think that's for workforce development. But I'd like to know if, if you could tell me what he means by an additional $20 million and an additional $8 million. Does he mean that uh, he wants that much over and above the budget that has been submitted? Or does he mean that he wants that instead of, but in, if it's instead of other expenditures, what does he want to sacrifice uh, for that? So th that's my question. Senator Starr. Uh, thank you, uh, Frank. Uh, maybe you should ask the governor your question, uh, because I'm not a mind reader. <laughs> uh, but anyway, <laughs> the, the way the, the process works is the governor presents a budget to us, and uh, then the House deals with, with the budget which they just passed and sent over to us in the Senate. And in that bill, there's hundreds, there's probably 120, 150 million dollars for housing, repair and new. And the, the big issue is that we don't even have enough contractors to build all the housing that we've got money in the budget for right now. And then we had a little bill with housing in it just Friday, I think it was. And um, we, more money in there, I don't know, another 30 or $40 million in that bill. 
But there was a clause in that bill um, that said if you're a small contractor and you do jobs under $5,000, $5, you have to register and get licensed and so that, you know, good, poor people don't get ripped off by these contractors that build. Well, that tied that bill up, uh, well, for probably now two weeks because of sticking that clause in there. And that didn't come from the governor. That came from our Economic uh, and Housing Development Committee. And we finally got that negotiated up to $10,000. So the bill did pass with that in it so that, you know, there's a lot of retired carpenters around and, and handy people that will come to your house and do small jobs. Well, this was going to knock them right out of the picture, so then we'd even have a bigger problem getting houses back into shape and fixed. But I think now, <coughs> um, I believe that bill passed the, the Senate on a, una a unanimous vote, uh, but as far as putting more money in, golly, we've dumped millions and millions into housing and rehabbing housing. And uh, one of the, I don't know if it was Mike, I think, that talked about uh, the uh, career centers getting money to go help fix housing. Uh, so I, I really don't know what the 20 million more is unless it was in that bill that we passed the other day, but I, I don't know where we would spend it if we put it in there unless we carried it forward uh, down the road. So, um, but send your note to the governor and ask him what he meant, and then let us know what he meant, and then we'll all know what he meant. <laughs> Representative Marcott. Thanks for the question, Frank. Um, so, as Bobby said, the, the budget just passed the House, um, I think a week, a week and a half ago. Um, I have supported the budget that came out of the House. Um, the House took a, a different direction. Number one, the housing component, um, I think the House is waiting for that bill to come over uh, from the Senate. Um, so the House hasn't had a chance to, to, to weigh in on it yet. Um, I think. I don't know what the governor is talking about. Um, you'd have to ask him. Um, I haven't had conversations with him about housing, and although it, it does uh, deal with economic development and workforce development, um, it's not part of my my purview and my committee. Um, although we do weigh in on it sometimes, I will say that that the direction that we took in the house for economic development was. Um, workforce development and workforce development is economic development without workers our businesses aren't going to grow and they're not going to make money and we're not going to be able to raise more taxes um, through that economic development so um, workforce development is is really needed um, we chose that route we did however pass um, H624 which is um, the creative economy uh, bill that um, we reappropriated $17.5 million of the $30 million that was appropriated last year for the bridge gap funding for businesses. Um, in the end, that was supposed to be a very quick bill to go through to help businesses before the federal government's money came through in, in May and June. Um, the House, we got it out of my committee, the House passed it out at the end of February. Um, it never got out of the Senate until um, the end of the session. And so by the time that got out, the other monies were out already. Um, then um, there were so many restrictions to it um, that very few businesses applied. So we were only able to get about um, 5 million, 5.5 million, 4.5 million out. In, and so we had this chunk of money sitting there, $25.5 million of ARPA money federal dollars that are supposed to get injected into the economy to help the state that are just sitting there doing nothing. 
So we decided to take uh, H624, um, reappropriate 17.5 million of that money that's in this year's budget already to help the creative economy, which is expansive. There's, I think, 110 um, and, uh, NACE codes of businesses that, can, that could apply for that. So it's now in the Senate. Um, we're waiting for them to um, now take a look at H703 and 624. In the meantime, um, I don't have an economic development bill from them yet. Um, H159 is the vehicle that they're using to, to move their thoughts on economic development. Um, we're three weeks after crossover. Um, I still don't have it. It's in Senate finance now. When it gets done there, it's got to go to Senate appropriations. I don't expect an economic development bill to come to me for the next week or two, um, which is <laughs> extremely difficult on my part to try to then turn around that bill and get it back over to the Senate. Um, and do my due diligence on it. So um, th there's been some hiccups going on between the House and the Senate, and I think some of that is, you know, the Senate being out so long um, and just rejoining us again and not being able to have those, like Bobby said, those hallway conversations of how we move things along. So um, that's where I am on, on that anyway. Thank you. Representative Page. Uh, $8.1 billion budget. I did uh, vote in favor of it, and it was based upon workforce development as well as health care. I looked at those aspects of it, and I voted for the budget. Incidentally, you can go online and you can see how we vote. Uh, it's there for everyone to see. Um, our caucus, the Republican caucus, has not had a meeting with the governor regarding anything. Uh, since since we came back, actually. Um, it's my understanding from reading uh, newspapers and what you, you know, some of the scuttles, some of the inf back, back room information that you hear is that um, the governor would like to see more for housing and workforce. He's also um, not pleased. He thinks his budget can do more than what we have uh, previously approved. There are some things in there that I wish had been approved. There's an issue regarding military retirements. Um, unfortunately, that bill um, is not going anywhere and my recommendation was to kill it because that bill said you had to make a choice uh, for non-taxation, whether it be your social security benefits or whether your military benefits. And, and why should you have to make that choice? So that's one of the things that he didn't care in the budget, and I don't care either. But sometimes, you know, you have to hold your nose and you have to for vote for some of these things. But I think overall, I think it was a, it's, a, it's a good budget. As I said, it works on health, uh, the health care issue as well as our workforce issues. So. Representative Sims. Uh, th thanks for the question. And, um, you know, ha we are in the middle of a housing crisis. I'm, I'm sure we're all hearing the stories of folks who, you know, can't find affordable rentals, can't find a house to buy, and having access to housing is critical for recruitment and retention of, of employees. I'm hearing from, you know, so many of our employers that they're, you know, attracting teachers, uh, ultrasound techs, and they just cannot find a place to live. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm really pleased that we are um, using our ARPA federal stimulus to make transformational investments in housing. The $50 million that we've allocated in the budget will go to VHCB to build, um, you know, additional um, uh, housing units. We need to get more net new units online, and I'm pleased with the Senate bill that allocates an additional $30 million. Um, uh, I think continuing to um, expand and extend the uh, VHIP housing program, which would provide grants to um, landlords to bring additional properties um, back online. So if there are units with compliant issues that are keeping them off the market, small grants can make a big difference in getting those units back online um, and, and in the market. You know, Again, we need to make sure that we have um, more um, available units um, here in our region and really across the whole state. Um, so, so pleased to see that those investments 
investments are, are moving forward in, in the budget, and hopefully we'll continue to do work on that. Um, contractor bill, <laughs> or, or the, the contractor registry, won't, won't slow down this, this next round of investment in housing. Um, you know, one of the things that I'd, I'd like to flag as we're talking about housing um, is, is Act 250. There's another opportunity to make, um, I think, important reforms this year to address some of the longstanding challenges that we've had 50 years into Act 250. Um, it's been, you know, a, a, a very important um, uh, uh, set of laws that ensure we're protecting our environment while we're also um, making sensible development. And so continuing to ease regulations in our downtown and villages where we know additional development is sustainable um, is, is, I think, a really important part of this. As, as we move more resources for housing, that we're looking at our downtowns and villages and finding ways to, to um, uh, expand in places where development is sustainable. And so hope that we can continue to make progress on the Act 250 bill um, before House Naturals, um, but before the end of the year. Thanks. Next question, yes. Bernie Peters, Weilberg. I guess this falls under a safety question for motor vehicles. Please identify yourself. Huh? Please identify yourself. Oh, Bernard Peters. Eisberg. Okay, I think this falls under safety. Motor vehicles is talking about safety. Now this is where I have a little problem. All these new cars, and I think, well, yeah, we're all uh, mature people in here now. <laughs> these new cars, when you meet them now, you can't see no more. They blind you. Supposedly, they're supposed to have dimmer switches, I guess, or something. But I'll tell you right now, we got a gentleman up our way. He's got an expensive pickup, dually. He's got halogen lights or whatever you call them. Then he puts another set in the grill. Then he's got light bars all over it. When I meet him, I have to stop because I cannot see the road no more. Now, that's a safety issue. Now, my car is old enough now to buy its own liquor. I mean, <laughs> and what I'm saying is, when you blind somebody, you can't see the road, so what's going to happen? Sooner or later, somebody's going to have a head on, or somebody's going to go off the road. I had another gentleman. He had a, he had a Hummer. Headlight set up the same way. I met him one night. I just happened to catch a glimpse of something moving. I stopped. He was coming at me. He never see that deer. He hit that deer. Guess where the deer landed? On my car. So in no way he'd see that deer. He never touched the brake. If I'd have kept going, that deer would have been in the windshield. I probably wouldn't have been in very good condition. So when we talk about safety, I'm all for safety. But these bright headlights should have a limit on how much they show. And for some reason, if people ain't, I don't know how to use the word, if they ain't read their owner's manual, know there's a dimmer switch, they ought to know that they made them on vehicles. And you can still use them if they're not automatic. And sooner or later, there's going to be some bad accidents because I can tell whether there's a deer out there, whether it's got horns on it quite a distance, but I can't see when I get lights in my eyes like that. I, I'm the one like the deer in the headlight. I can't see. So I think something should be addressed by motor vehicles when they have a car inspected. They want to have this, 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 and this for safety. I think this is a safety issue, and I think it would be nice if it was addressed. Senator Starr. Yeah, uh, thank you, Bernd. Um, there, there are rules and regulations on the candle power of your headlights, and when you take your car to be inspected, they're supposed to check those, and what happens is some people take that stuff off go get their vehicle inspected, then they go back home, put it back on, and I, I don't think that's a good practice, but you would think that with the number of police we have, um, uh, they should meet these guys occasionally and stop them and give them a ticket because um, the older you get, the harder it is to see. And uh, so I understand where you're coming from, Bernard. And, 
And those new cars with those automatic dimmers, if, if the little dial isn't turned right, they don't dim. You have to flip the handle, which is really a lot of work uh, to <laughs> flip the handle. But uh, anyways, um, I think the state police should uh, know about this along with motor vehicle and uh, the motor vehicle inspector, uh, the commissioner of motor vehicles, and then they can, she can talk to uh, the inspection people uh, and double check that. Representative Marcotte. Don't have anything more to add in the uh, Representative Page. Representative Sims. Okay. Uh, some? Okay. Yeah, you got to come up here and. <laughs> My name is Dennis Percy. I'm employed at Fred's Energy. I'm the general manager there. And I see some things happening with fossil fuels that we're really getting targeted uh, as far as pay the expenses to go to electric or what have you, uh, whatever the <laughs> fuels are out there. Um, how many people here burn fossil fuels? If you raise your hand. How many people here have heat pumps? Do you have to use backup heat in January? <clears throat> we install heat pumps. We've been installing heat pumps for quite a few years. And believe me, I, I know what heat pumps will do. This January or <clears throat> when it was extremely cold, I get the call my heat pump won't heat my house. Well, when we go out and install them, I tell them, don't get rid of your fossil fuel. <clears throat> we're, last I knew, we're the second biggest <clears throat> fuel assistance dealer in the state of Vermont. And I see these people that, believe me, we're all for cutting down on the carbon footprint. That's why we install heat pumps. There's no incentive for people out there to put in a more efficient boiler, put in something that's going to cut down. There's a lot of houses. If you go down Main Street, Derby Line, you're going to see these huge houses up there. They can't afford to change your heating system. Heat pumps aren't going to do it. You put a brand new high efficiency house in, yeah, maybe you'll get by with it. When the temperatures drop down below zero, your heat pump efficiency goes down the toilet. So think about, we're never gonna get rid of fossil fuels in my lifetime, but let's help these people out there to cut down on the fire carbon footprint and not just put heat pumps. What I see heat pumps are doing it's giving the electric companies more power in the summer because everybody's using them for air conditioning, never had air conditioning. So here they are <clears throat> burning more electricity, which I'm told that in order for everybody to heat the house with electricity or, or uh, heat pumps or whatever, the power company is going to have to invest $2 billion to upgrade the power grid. Who's going to pay for Excuse me, we yeah. only have five minutes. So okay. So yeah. respond as quickly as they can. Senator Starr. Uh, thank you, D Dennis. Uh, the place I live in, Montpelier, uh, when I'm, now we're back there, uh, the guy's got three heat pumps uh, in his house, and it's probably 20 years old, the house. And I... The other day, night, I asked him, I said, well, how are your heat pumps working out? Well, he said, uh, if it's warm, they work good. And, uh, but he said, uh, back, 
back in January wasn't so good. I had to keep my get my furnace going. Uh, you know, I think some people are pushing the pencil ahead of where we are really ready to go. And uh, you know, the uh, what Dennis said about the utilities and having to upgrade the grids and all of that uh, is very accurate. And uh, when I built my house 40 years ago or 50, whatever it was, I put electric heat in. Hey, that was the thing to do. And and they priced, they jacked to put winter rates on and jacked the price so high that I had to take the electric heat out. And now I call them smart people. The, the smart people are telling me, well, you ought to put that electric heat back in. I said, no, I've already been there once. I'm not. But anyways, uh, the fossil fuel issue is, uh, you know, it's a serious issue. And and we should try to do our our part. But uh, I think we're, we're doing our part. But the environmental people are pushing it beyond where we can do much better. Sorry to move you right along, but we have to. We have one minute for each of our legislators. Uh, Mike Marcotte. So I've, I've stayed extra. I'm hoping I can get fired. Um, <laughs> so I, I think one thing that, that I think you were talking about, Dennis, is, is helping you know homeowners and I think you're talking about weatherization. And we've been putting a ton of money into weatherization over the last few years. And so um, that's going to help. But we can't throw all our eggs into heat pumps. That's not going to do it either. So, um, you know, we need to, there's got to be a mix of everything. And weatherization, I think, is the right place to go for people. I know Catherine has a bill in her committee that she can speak more to that. Representative Page. I would agree with my colleagues, electricity is expensive. I think the state is moving too quickly on trying to reduce our, our um, carbon footprint, uh, whether it be for our transportation needs or whether it's our heating needs. And as Mike Marcotte said, I think uh, our efforts should be on um, insulation of our homes. Thank you. Representative Sims. Yeah, thanks for the question, Dennis, and thanks for the really important work that Fred's and all of our small fuel dealers, um, you know, provide for our communities. You're like critical energy distribution infrastructure. Um, uh, so I, th I think part of what this is about is is the clean heat bill that um, came out of uh, the committee I'm on, energy and technology, which looks to help address um, the cost of um, heating with fossil fuels as well as our you know emissions reductions goals and you know I, I think we all know one of our largest expenses right in northern Vermont is is how we heat our homes and when we rely on fossil fuels to heat our homes um, it can be incredibly volatile um, from a price perspective and we've all seen that over the last several months that you know the uh, it was 2.30 a gallon last year, and it's over $4 a gallon right now. And so, one of the key ways that we can help everyone um, afford to heat their home is by helping transition off fossil fuels. And so, the bill, Clean Heat Standard, um, creates a number of pathways to help everyone take advantage of a clean heat future. Not only heat pumps, Sorry, but to, uh, okay. Conclude. But I, 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 I <laughs> okay. So I, I I'd just, like to thank the East Side <laughs> Restaurant, Dan Pellerin, Vermont North Country Chamber of Commerce, Todd Prano, and members of the press and the attendant legislators. Please make sure you put $5 at the table if you partook of the breakfast. The next breakfast will be held here on April 25th, at which our scheduled presenters will be Senator Russell Ingalls and Representative Vicki Strong, Brian Smith, Larry Labor, and Mark Higley. Thank you all for attending. <laughs>